Welcome back to our new show. I'm Robert Wright, and this is The Common Good. Let's dive in. Uh, first, Trump's State of the Union address. Now, I refuse to give our, our ratings-obsessed demagogue the satisfaction of tuning in, but it seems like it went just as expected, full of outright lies, partisan bullying, and theatrical-made four TV spectacles. Trump's takeover of the party was on full display when Republicans chanted four more years during the speech, and when they raucously cheered for, can you believe it, Rush Limbaugh. Rin Limbo outrageously was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Hello? Limbo has been a staple of right-wing vitriol for decades. His career is littered with vile remarks about women, minorities, the LGBTQ community, and everyone in between. Limbaugh is truly the worst of the worst, and this week he was bestowed with the highest civilian honor our country can give. It's it's hard not to get discouraged watching that. Just a day later, the Senate voted to acquit our lawless president. I mean, acquittal, how can you be acquitted from a trial that is a show trial that is not even a trial? But he was acquitted anyway, stamping out any remaining illusion of checks and balances or co-equal branches of government. Just one Republican senator, Mitt Romney of Utah, I never thought I'd be praising Mitt Romney of Utah, broke ranks uh, to convict Trump voting for the abuse of power article. Romney's colleagues have given Trump carte blanche to run amok as he seeks re-election, and their only pushback will be a gentle admonishment here or a froed brow there. Looking at you, Susan Collins. I hope you don't get re-elected. I hope people of Maine don't re-elect her, please. Trump is the first impeached president in history to seek re-election. And there's no telling what he's going to do to win. Now that he knows no one will hold him accountable, he can do anything. He will do anything. And lastly, we have the Iowa caucus earlier this week. Uh, it shook Americans' faith in our government that app glitch did it. Uh, it sort of uh, shook Americans' faith in the electoral process, our political leaders, the app glitch, and the secrecy surrounding the delayed results create an atmosphere ripe for conspiracy theories, anger, distrust toward party leaders, and infighting among Democrats. That's the last thing we need. Again, it's hard not to get a little bit discouraged, but I urge you focus on the big picture. The primary process had barely begun, and Iowa is just one out of 50 states. It is a small state. It is a small, lily-white state. And it's one out of 50 that will choose eventually our nominee. So don't get down. Get angry, get organized, follow Nancy Pelosi's lead and tear up Trump's playbook. Keep your eyes on the prize, winning in November and flipping the Senate. Now, I know it can feel discouraging. The events of this week are just a microcosm of all the hatefulness and corruption we have been experiencing for the past three years. We're up against a lot, friends, but I have seen this country survive dark times and come out stronger on the other side. And I believe we can do it again. So don't agonize, organize. Pretty good saying. And now to dig deeper, I'm joined by perennial millennial, Katie Milne. Well, hello, Katie. Hi, Bob, how are, are you? Are you in a good mood? Um, yeah. We're... I don't know why. This has been a <laughs> shitty week. I mean, it's really, I yeah. mean, let's be candid. Yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't been great. Not for democracy, not for the electorate. Not for anybody. Yeah. Uh, but I, it, I really think it's important to kind of Keep our spirits up. Yeah, I think so. For so the battles ahead. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, let's dive in. Again, there's not really anything to talk about. Um, first, there's, uh, no, there's <laughs> nothing to talk about except the fate of the nation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just casual stuff. So first up, the Iowa caucus on Monday didn't go as planned. No, clearly. It, it, it didn't. But I really, I, I'm not very upset about it. I mean, I think that people are getting upset about something that's very small. Yes, there was a glitch, there was a technical glitch, uh, but let's not get it out of proportion. I mean, uh, Bernie Sanders won the popular vote. Buttigieg won the delegate vote. Yeah, can you explain how that works? Because, I mean, everyone knows how there's discrepancies between the electoral college on the national level and the popular vote, but it's I actually about, it's the didn't same, know. It's, well, it's the same thing at the state level, and mm -hmm. it's for basically the same reason. It's because of the way precincts are organized. Uh, but the most important thing is that both of them got a boost, and the big loser 
is actually Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden came at the bottom and he was counting on a little bit of momentum. If you can't get anybody out of Iowa, I mean, you know, you may not be at the top. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think um, I think the whole debacle surrounding the delayed results, I think it was really overblown. And I think the media had a huge role to play in well, that. The media has a huge role huge to play. Huge role. Because the media wants to fill up all the time. Exactly. And all of those people, I, I, I empathize with them. You know, there's people sitting there behind the desks in those studios uh, having nothing to say. You know, they prepped all day. They were ready to say, well, if Buttigieg went, blah, 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 and they had nothing to say. Yeah. Can you imagine being... In their positions. Yeah, I mean, it my must, heart went out to them. <laughs> yeah, and, and it is, it is tough. But I also think that we shouldn't expect delayed results. You know, I think the media created the sense of secrecy and you know this sense of gravitas around delayed results. It's a huge deal. But I personally think it's a good thing to have delayed results if that means that people are doing their due di diligence of course, and well, democracy, double checking. Exactly, D democracy I, is not about speed. Yeah, I mean, it's not an instant gratification thing. And we got to get away from that entertainment aspect mm -hmm. of, of democracy. I, I do think, though, that uh, that Biden is in trouble. The, the one another big winner actually is Bloomberg, because with with Biden yeah. out of the way, it kind of creates a void in terms of the so-called center. Yeah, and he even came out and said that the debacle in Iowa encouraged him to buy up even more ad space in Super Tuesday He's states. He's doubling. He's doubling his budget, Katie. His budget was <laughs> already a billion. It's yeah. now going to two billion. I it's mean, crazy. It's... Yeah. So I really, and I do think, even though Buttigieg and Bernie did come out on top, I do think that the delayed results and all of the theories surrounding that and all of the, this app and this company is connected to this company and the national organizer's spouse is on this board and all of this, these Forget theories it. about it. I think it did kind of dampen any potential boost that Pete and Bernie could have gotten going going into New Hampshire and it did it did kind of lessen how badly Biden how how distant of a fourth he came in. So I think people kind of just wrote it off and now everyone's eyes are on New Hampshire. But the thing about New Hampshire is that it's also a an overwhelmingly white state. Another so, overwhelming white yeah. state. I think this is going to cause a lot of people in the Democratic Party and maybe even possibly in the Republican, no, I take back, the Republican Party doesn't care. <laughs> no, they're too far But gone. in the Repu Democratic Party, I think they are going to really rethink uh, this, uh, the, the whole idea of having Iowa and New Hampshire, the first two states. That It was absurd 50 years ago, and it is more absurd now. Yeah, I think that's maybe the one silver lining coming out of Iowa is that it really put on display how messy and undemocratic caucuses are. I saw, I read this really amazing article from The Guardian talking to people who have been prevented to going to caucuses in the past because they have a disability. And I saw this really amazing thing. There's this, uh, the first caucus that was accessible to deaf people. And these this couple in their 60s, it was their first time going to a caucus because somebody had made it accessible. So I think that kind of put on display, like that's amazing, but voting should be, it's a basic right. So it should be accessible to everyone. Well, the caucus, the caucus states, I mean, mm -hmm. they're now down to five. And it's not going to be a big leap to just make them all primary states. So I think yeah. the two reforms are getting rid of Iowa and New Hampshire as the beginnings, and also everybody has to have a primary. Yeah. So I guess that's another silver lining is that Iowa already played an outsized role and kind of the mess surrounding this, it kind of downplayed how how much people are reading into the results. So. Well, there's silver linings here, but remember, this is an election year that where they're, the only silver lining this year is getting rid of Donald Trump. Exactly. Yeah. So speaking of getting rid of Donald Trump, the Senate voted this week to officially acquit him, which we all knew was coming. Um, senator Mitt Romney from Utah was the only Republican senator to break ranks, and he voted to convict on the abuse of power article of impeachment. You know, I don't think we should say that he was acquitted. I mean, if somebody yeah. does not have a trial and the trial or the trial is a show trial or it is a, a trial that's rigged, being acquitted, thats you don't get acquitted from a show trial. Yeah, you can't get acquitted in a trial that doesn't have witnesses because every trial should have witnesses. So I think, yeah. All we know is he was impeached in the House. Period. Exactly. Yeah. And I honestly, I really want to commend Senator Romney for voting to convict on one of the articles because it's not clearly we've seen Trump has a massive stranglehold on the Republican Party. And it, it, it did take a lot of courage. And again, as you mentioned earlier, I never thought I would be praising the former Republican presidential nominee. But here we are. And that's just um, a sign of how far the Republican Party has fallen that only 
one Republican senator broke ranks. Yeah, and I mean, really, with Susan Collins and also Murkowski. Uh, I mean, I mean, Murkowski, uh, and and you had so many. I mean, there there were there were a number of them who at least showed some signs of life. Uh, but I mean, even Lamar Alexander. I mean, what in the world is going oh on? This is a this is a cult. And it resembles a kind of a takeover, authoritarian takeover of an entire party. Yeah. Uh, and I, look, people say to me, well, why are you so worried about the Republican Party? If they want to be zombies, that's okay. We need two parties. There are two governing parties to make a democracy work, at least two. Yeah. And the Senate is a really undemocratic institution already. Um, think about, I found this quote that I really stuck with me. So the chief justice appointed by a president who lost the popular vote presided over a vote in which senators who re represent a minority of the population voted against the wishes of 70% of the country to cover up abuses of a president who lost the popular vote. So the Senate's already a really undemocratic institution. And I think it's just a sign that we're com we're getting into really, really dangerous territory. I don't think we should just write off that acquittal was assumed. There are a lot of other darker forces at play here where Republicans are buttressed by all of these undemocratic institutions like the Electoral College, the Senate, partisan gerrymandering, and then these kind of urban rural geographic trends. And they're only going to get worse. So they the are going to get well. They are getting worse. Yeah. I mean, because the imbalances uh, in terms of population. Uh, you know, Wyoming has what five people and a bunch of cows. <laughs> yeah, I, I think mean, they have five two, people. They have two senators, mm -hmm. the same as California, and that's going to get worse. Yeah. Over time, because more and more people are moving to the coasts, moving to big cities. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of the jobs are, and so we're depopulating a lot of the places where the founding fathers said, "Well, we need two senators." The only way around that, and I'm going to say something that is probably pretty shocking, and anybody watching, just uh, forget that I said this, all right? Okay. <laughs> uh, when we have a president, a decent president, and two houses of Congress, a Senate and a House that are decent, uh, I think we've got to uh, make California three states uh, and change the state. I mean, there's nothing- That is the a hot take Wait a minute, if I've ever there's, heard there's one. There's nothing in the Constitution that says- that the states have to be this organized this way. And we've got to reorganize the states, reorganize yeah. the borders of the states. Yeah, I don't know if we're gonna get to California becoming three states and then okay, four anytime- states. Oh, four Five states, states of course. I'll take Easy. as many as, as uh, all right. But yeah, going back to this urban rural geographic trend, I think that's a huge reason why Republicans have been so ready to let Trump take over their party because it's been this complete transformation. And it can't just be because of these tax cuts and these regulatory rollbacks. There's something deeper at play here. And it's because, what well, I think it's because Republicans have a core base of mostly white, mostly rural, conservative, evangelical, older Christians. So they only have, as long as they keep turning out that base, they're buttressed by all of these other undemocratic institutions. They have a bulwark against the electorate. Yes, but that means that bulwark has got to get higher and higher and higher. Yeah. Because all of these the pro-democratic forces mm -hmm. demographically yeah. are actually going to overwhelm their their bulwarks unless they create more voter suppression, more gerrymandering, more uh, of this kind of inequity. Which they're trying to which do. Which they're trying to do. But there's a limit to how much they can yeah. do. Now, unfortunately, they're not going to be able to be limited by by November. So the true, question yeah. in my mind is what happens when we, if, if Trump is reelected, uh, not only do we have two more or three more Trump Supreme Court justices, but we also have a lot of Trump-like activity in the states that are going to further uh, anti move toward an anti-democracy, oh, move toward definitely. A, a kind of- uh, he, he has a, tri a trickle-down effect in the party for sure. You see like these, you know, random state lawmakers just- imitating his tactics. And it's really scary to see the effect that he's had on the party. But it's because he turns out their base like no one else can. He has their base dedicated all in. So as long as he can keep turning out that smaller, whiter, more rural faction of the electorate and the Republicans are backed up by all of these undemocratic buttresses, then they are they don't care what he says or what he does well, as long you. as he turns out the base. Katie, I agree with you up to a point, but I mm -hmm. think that the Democrats have also lost the working class, not just the white working class, the entire working class. Okay. And I am partly responsible <laughs> in my own small way because mm -hmm. I was Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. Uh, I think the Democrats 
Democrats could have done and should do more for the working class. I mean, to raise okay. wages, to create a working class party. That's what it was under Definitely. Franklin D. Roosevelt. And so that can help. I think what Donald Trump has done, in addition to everything you said, is create the impression among the working class that he is their champion, uh, which is obviously a fraud. Yeah. But he had, yeah, studying his campaign is a really fascinating lesson in rhetoric and persuasion tactics because and, he is so opposite of, you know, the average working Joe. He is the opposite of that. I mean, he had a literal gold toilet in his house. He, he is, is the elite of the elite. He is the elite. Well, not only is he a billionaire elite of the elites, but also he is what you get when you combine a sociopath with a con man. Yeah. Uh, and you, it, it is dangerous. I mean, yeah. it is really dangerous. It and I, I really don't mean is. to minimize that. No, definitely. And I think we definitely have our work cut out for us. But I think, I mean, everyone knew that the acquittal was a shoe in from the beginning, but we can't lose sight of just how terrifying it is for our democracy. Well, it is. And it's your generation. I mean, I, I, I hate know, to we're say screwed. it. You guys but, screwed us. But us, you know, OK, boomers, you we're going to we're going to be gone. Yeah. I mean, it's you're going to be around yeah. you guys. Thanks. So will you please? Really appreciate that, well, Bob. Well, I just, <laughs> uh, we decided that we'd leave it to you, the mess yeah. to you guys. Yeah. Well, and speaking of Trump's dem demagoguery and his being a sociopath, we had a lot of stuff to choose from for our But Actually segment this week. Yes. Because he gave his State of the Union address, and naturally, as we expected, it was full of just blatant lies, demonstrably false claims. It was also the most divisive yeah. State of the Union. I've, I've, I used to, you know, in my old days when I was in the administration, I used to sit in the well of the House chamber Ooh. and watch Bill Clinton mm -hmm. uh, give his State of the Union addresses. And, you know, you get up and you applaud and you sit and you will get up and applaud. Uh, but every president, Democrat or Republican that I remember, has always appealed to the other party to try to uh, appeal to the nation and appeal to the nation's uh, unity. Well, this was the first time I've ever seen a speech that was so intentionally divisive. Uh, and Donald, that's Donald Trump's trademark. Yeah, exactly. So let's take a look at this clip. I've also made an ironclad pledge to American families. We will always protect patients with pre-existing conditions. You know, did you see Nancy Pelosi's face in back of him? I mean, even before she tore his speech up. Yeah. Uh, well, but actually, hello, uh, that's an utter he lie. Won't. Well, yeah. he won't because the Democrat, the Republican Party and Trump, they are right now trying, still trying to repeal. Right now. Right Literally, now. Right, right now. Right they right now. are in court arguing, and they have been for months, trying to get the entire Affordable Care Act repealed, which, as you know, has protections for pre-existing patients with pre-existing conditions. Yeah, so that w that's not only is this a lie. But it is a dangerous lie. It is a dangerous distortion. They are seeking through the court to get the entire Affordable Care Act and pre-existing conditions thrown out. Yes. And I really, really want Democrats to hammer home this message because the Supreme Court isn't going to take up the case until after the 2020 election. But I really want Democrats to really hammer home this message that the Trump administration is right now trying to take away health care from 30 million Americans. Including pre-existing yeah. conditions. Uh, so, all right. Katie Millen says Democrats hammer away at that. That is my instructions. Yeah. All right. And, and on that upbeat note. Upbeat note. Katie taking Millen, healthcare thank, away. Uh, th thank you very much. <laughs> of course. And I'll see you next week. See you. Thank you, Katie. And remember to keep your eyes on the prize. Don't be distracted, dismayed, disgruntled, disturbed, discombobulated by Trump and the Republicans. You and I and everybody you know and I know needs to organize and mobilize and energize ourselves for the battle ahead. It's the battle that will determine the fate of America and the world. But also, don't forget to dance. We'll see you next week.